members or non-members, and the prizes are, are usually pretty great. Last team that won uh, took home four bottles of wine. So, uh, quite enticing. But without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce you to our speaker tonight, Dr. Llewellyn Tolman. Dr. Llewellyn grew up in Thailand and later worked on public on public administration reform and emergency management consulting projects in Thailand and 30 other developing countries. He holds a PhD in public administration and economics from American University and formerly was the chair of the section on emergency management for the American Society for Public Administration. He has led searches for missing persons, aircraft, plantations, battlefields and POW camps, often sponsored by the Explorers Club and the Royal Geographic Society. He's the adventure and travel editor and columnist for the Montgomery Sentinel of Maryland and author of the nonfiction book, The Most Traveled Man on Earth. He worked on the Thompson disappearance for two years and recently produced a 687 page report on the case. Um, he is here to set a few facts straight and uh, shed some light on this mysterious disappearance of a great man. So without further ado, please give a hand to Lou. I'll be moving over here uh, because we want to focus on the slides tonight, uh, not on me, and we'll focus on Jim Thompson, uh, an amazing story. Can you hear me all right in the back? Way in the back? Yes, okay, all right, I see hands going up. That's a good sign. All right, and uh, if we can dim the lights just a little bit, that'll be good. Okay, I think you've heard enough about me. And today we're gonna cover the following topics. Uh, the exotic life of Jim Thompson, the disappearance and the search, uh, theories about the disappearance, analysis of the search, and then the murder of Jim's sister in Pennsylvania and a current or recent case in the Cameron Highlands where Jim disappeared. And uh, also cover some conclusions and implications. So that's the sort of roadmap of where we're going tonight. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what we're really talking about, this case has absolutely everything you can imagine. I mean, it's got tigers, it's got snakes, it's got aborigines, it's got pit traps. It's got mystics, movie stars, uh, politicians, conspiracies, everything that makes life worth living. It's, it's really incredible. And you've got agencies running around. You've got the CIA, uh, Department of State, the Malaysian Army, the Thai Army, the uh, US Army, um, all running around in the jungle. It's, it's just, you couldn't make this stuff up. I mean, it really is quite an amazing story. So I hope you'll uh, come along with me and enjoy the wild ride. So let's talk about his exotic life. He was uh, born in 1906. He uh, was an architect, spoke fluent French. Uh, he w had an occasional hot temper. Uh, he was too trusting of his subordinates and they often uh, stole from him. Might be uh, connected to the case. Uh, during the war, as we'll see in a second, he was an OSS intelligence officer. So he was with the Office of Strategic Services. Uh, and then later became arguably a CIA agent of influence uh, here in Bangkok. He had no children and he divorced early. Uh, he had many affairs, most of them with women. <laughs> he was an art expert and avid Asian art collector. Uh, during the war, he rose from army private to OSS lieutenant colonel in just six years. So that was a remarkable achievement and I think a reflection on his intelligence and drive. Uh, he served at first in France behind the lines, parachuting uh, in on secret missions, uh, which unfortunately, the details of which have never come to light. Uh, he also did the same in the Balkans, and he was about to parachute into uh, Thailand to help the free, Fre uh, the free Thai movement when literally on the plane they got the word that the atom bomb had been dropped and the war was probably gonna end very shortly, and so the plane turned around, went back to Ceylon, and he was able to come in in a more normal way and land uh, rather than parachute in here. 
he became the charge d'affaires uh, or the general attache, uh, what would today be called the chief of station for the OSS. Remember, they're the predecessor to the uh, CIA. And he became this um, uh, chief of station for a year after the war. Uh, by the way, during the war, he won five bronze stars uh, for his exploits uh, behind the lines, so uh, quite a guy. And his organization was pretty impressive. Uh, the Office of Strategic Services um, was so secret that they didn't even put their name on the um, office memorandum. If you look in the lower right, you see Office Memorandum, United States Government. Uh, these are all secret documents that I've uh, met, been able to get because through declassification and uh, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so on the lower left, you see that after serving a year as the chief of station, he resigned, uh, and that's just an ordinary uh, resignation letter. Uh, you can see his signature, very strong uh, signature there. And the lower right is kind of a more interesting memorandum. And it says that uh, Jim Thompson, formerly general attache in Bangkok, has returned uh, to the United States, to Washington, and he will not be returning to Siam in government service. And then the next sentence is redacted. In other words, it's blacked out by the CIA. And this is after 70 years. Uh, that's pretty amazing. You know, most things get declassified uh, sooner than that. So what does that sentence say? Well, you know, obviously I don't know, but, uh, and nobody does except the folks at, at CIA who blacked it out. But from the context, it seems possible that it says that he's returning to Siam, uh, but will be under non-diplomatic cover or illegal cover, uh, meaning he'll be an asset to the agency, uh, but will not be uh, official. But well, we don't know. He certainly did uh, become an asset for the CIA uh, in the 50s. And he built the Thai silk industry, as we all know, um, and uh, these are pictures of, of him and of his uh, outlets, and you can buy uh, Jim Thompson Thai silk now in the States as well as uh, here, and I urge you to buy some. It's, some, it's just fabulous uh, stuff. And all of the, in the background, you'll see some of the iridescent, uh, wonderful Thai silk uh, that he created. Wonderful eye for color. He first, before he got involved in this, he, for a few months, owned a substantial interest in the Oriental Hotel. Uh, but he gave that up uh, because he got into a dispute with the other owners, and he also felt that uh, the place was so run down that it would never make a success. <laughs> so he did make some business mistakes from time to time. Uh, that was probably fortunate that he got out of the Oriental Hotel because that's when the Thai silk industry caught his eye. And at the time, it was really uh, totally moribund. There was no exports. Uh, nobody really heard of it much. Uh, but he stumbled across it and started to... Uh, realize what a terrific opportunity it was. As you know, his house museum in Bangkok is uh, fantastic. Uh, it's got, um, it's stuffed with art. And uh, how many here have visited? Everybody, I hope? OK, all right, excellent, yes. And I urge you to go again. I was talking to someone earlier who'd been 15 times. Uh, and I think it would take about that many times to see it. Uh, the house, as you probably recall is six different houses that were assembled from all over the country and brought to Bangkok. Uh, and he stuffed it with art, including a lot of Thai art. But as we'll see in a minute, uh, a lot of that was dispersed after he got into a huge dispute with the Thai government uh, over some of that art. One of the reasons that he was probably one of the most famous uh, Americans in Thai history and uh, one of the most famous Americans in Southeast Asia at the time was because he entertained uh, every night. Um, sometimes just two or three people, but often up to 250 people would come to that wonderful house museum. Now, I, I understand that the food wasn't very good, but the atmosphere was amazing and the uh, ability to network was uh, quite incredible. As you can see here, just about everybody who was anybody in the 50s and 60s uh, who came through Asia would stop, of course, in Bangkok, and they would get invited to uh, go to Jim Thompson's fabulous house. So uh, I think you should probably recognize most of the folks here. Um, there's Adlai Stevenson, uh, Senator William Fulbright, uh, and the Time Magazine 
in the center there, the Fords, uh, Truman Capote, and Somerset Maugham. Most people don't realize that he was actually a uh, counter spy himself. He was with uh, MI5 for a while, the British uh, counterintelligence uh, outfit. And uh, you mentioned, you, you remember I mentioned that we have movie stars? Well, we, we got movie stars. Uh, he had clients, including Grace Kelly uh, and uh, Liz Taylor. Uh, the Queen of Thailand was one of his clients. And he got his big start when he managed to persuade the folks who were going to put the king and I on Broadway uh, to ha uh, costume everyone in Thai silk, which made a lot of sense. And that really got everything uh, taking off. He also sold Thai silk to the cast of Ben-Hur, uh, the first movie. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's any Thai silk in this recent remake, which is one of the reasons it's not as good as the original. Uh, in the lower left, you'll see that there was another client that I'm sort of proud of. That was my mother. Uh, we were stationed here for six years, and she ordered Thai silk. And on the day that I completed my kind of massive report on this case, my wife found this bill in our house. Uh, and it was sort of like Jim was talking to us from above or something. And this is where uh, he is saying that um, my mother is ordering some Thai silk, and he's confirming that order, and it's being sent to a friend in Mobile, Alabama. So what happened to this amazing fellow who was really a genius? I mean, he was multi-talented. You know, All the different things that he could do are quite staggering. He went for an Easter vacation, uh, just a short uh, weekend uh, vacation to Tanarata, Malaysia. That's in the Cameron Highlands. In the upper right, you'll see a 1960s view of the town at the time. It really just had one very short commercial street, a couple hundred yards long. And it's in a very difficult uh, area. If you've ever, how many people have been up to the Cameron Highlands? I, I know that some, yeah, okay, quite a few, about uh, a fifth or so. Uh, that's a picture in the upper left of the Garmin that I was using to navigate, and there were 214 different curves on the road up. It's very difficult terrain with sort of pyramid-shaped and conical-shaped hills, uh, and the roads are uh, almost all like that. When you're there, you can see the famous Cameron Highlands Land Rovers marked with CH on the side because they're not allowed to go anywhere else. They're so beat up. Uh, there's some tacky resorts now, but uh, there's still some beautiful views, as you see in the lower right. So on the day of the disappearance, which was March 26, 1967, Easter Sunday, uh, he awoke. He was staying at this location, the Moonlight Bungalow, which is on top of one of these conical hills. And you can stay there yourself, and I did. Um, I slept in that bedroom. It cost about $130 a night, and it's worth it. But unfortunately, the shade of Jim Thompson did not whisper anything in my ear and solve the case. Uh, that would have been nice. The last known photo is in the lower right, and that's Jim Thompson at a picnic in the morning just before he disappeared uh, that afternoon or evening. So he took a short afternoon walk, we think, uh, from the Moonlight Bungalow. You see in the upper left, that's a, a contemporaneous uh, picture uh, from the 60s. And he went walking uh, while his friends took a nap. Now, where did he go? Well, there's various possibilities, and you see those uh, in this slide. If you look in the upper right, the view off to the northwest, you see uh, some uh, undeveloped areas. That's where most of the searching took place because it was felt that he was probably uh, headed out that way. In the center is a view to the south, and that's a tongue of land, that green sward right in front of you, is a tongue of land that sticks out to the south and then in the distance, you can see another green patch. That is uh, the golf course in the middle of town. And it's about half a mile away. And you notice you can see it from here. So that'll come up in a minute, and I'll uh, explain the importance of that. The view to the west uh, in the left side from the Moonlight Bungalow is shown uh, uh, there. And you'll see that there's been developed now, but at the time, it was also thick jungle. 
and the jungle is quite treacherous and dense uh, there. He went for this walk. It's not clear whether he went out the back. There was a trail that no other writer had ever found, but I was able to document. There was a little, called the kitchen trail, went steeply downhill from behind the house. Uh, he might have gone out that way. There might have been another trail out the front, and there was certainly an access road, which still exists. Uh, so he had probably three different ways that he could have left uh, the house. The people he was staying with said that they heard some crunching in the gravel as he, uh, they think he walked away, which would support that he went out the back of the house. So he just disappeared. What happened? Well, uh, what happened first was a hasty search, which is typical in um, search and rescue, is that the friends and uh, People nearby organize a search, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, they searched until 2 a.m. that night, and probably involved 20 or 30 people uh, looking all over, running up and down the roads in that area, uh, shouting out, Jim, Jim, and trying to find him. Uh, they notified the local police and got them involved, and they did some searching that night, and then the next day, a really massive search was launched. And the search went on for 11 days, which is extremely long in typical search and rescue uh, times. Often searches are called off after just a day or two. So this was really probably the biggest search in, on land in Southeast Asian history. The FBI quickly got involved uh, because they were asked by the Malaysian uh, police to assist at the US end to find out more about his health conditions. Uh, Department of State started firing off uh, cables in all directions. The CIA was interested uh, because he was clearly uh, an asset. He had been helping set up meetings and so on. Um, and the Thai police got involved and basically no one was able to turn up anything. Not even a clue. No broken twigs, no uh, uh, clothes, no shredded uh, clothes or documents or anything like that. Uh, you'll see the picture there. That is a picture of J. Edgar Hoover, and this is a memo that was sent to Hoover in May 1967. So this is just about five weeks after the disappearance. And it says uh, that on Friday, um, Thompson arrived at the vacation bungalow. Uh, he stayed with friends and disappeared, and you know it summarizes the case. The, all those redacted bits, it's pretty easy to figure out what it says, and it basically just uh, lists the people that he was staying with. A more interesting memo is shown on the uh, right, and that's uh, an embassy uh, of the United States memo, uh, again, classified as secret, uh, to uh, William Bundy from another official, and it says that the first thing to be said is that, from Bangkok, is that there is virtually no prospect of a solution to the case that after several weeks of organized search in the jungle by the Malaysian authorities and police, and after Mr. Noon's careful expedition, this was an expert who was brought in who knew quite a bit about the Aborigines or Orang Asli who live in the region and who interviewed them. So after his careful expedition, there seems to be every reason to accept the judgment that Jim was not lost in the jungle, okay? So that became the official uh, agreed upon conclusion that pretty much everybody uh, had and that I think most people today have. And I, as I chatted with people before the talk, I think uh, most people support a conspiracy theory and that's certainly possible. Uh, and it was pretty clear that the Malaysian authorities came to that conclusion very quickly. So if he's not lost in the jungle, you know, and he didn't trip over a root or was eaten by a tiger or something like that, then clearly there must have been some sort of conspiracy involved. I mean, either he self-disappeared voluntarily or uh, he was kidnapped or something like that. So who are some of the suspects? What are some of the theories? Well, there's more theories than there are grains of sand on a beach, uh, but I'll try to summarize some of them. One is that the CIA itself uh, might have disappeared him. Uh, one author pushes this because he supposedly was peeved about Jim's supposed opposition to the Vietnam War. Remember, this was 67. The war was uh, hot. 
Uh, he had been more, much more sympathetic to the rebels uh, in the area uh, when he was in, in power. And it seems that he had lost favor with CIA, and so the theory is that they killed him. Uh, seems a little unlikely but that they would kill somebody so famous, but uh, who knows. Another interesting theory that really hasn't been uh, pushed much, but which I was able to find out, was that he apparently was having a long-term affair with Irina Yost, the beautiful Polish wife of UN Ambassador Charles Yost, who was a very famous uh, diplomat. And Charles was no dummy, and he must have known that this was going on. Um, seems unlikely that someone who eventually became US Ambassador to the United Nations would uh, kill somebody, but uh, stranger things have happened, and uh, certainly a police officer today would look into this as a possibility. Perhaps even more unlikely, it seems like, uh, the director of the Thai Fine Arts Department uh, was having a huge feud with Jim at the time. Uh, this director had accused Jim of looting the uh, patrimony of Thailand by buying Thai art. Uh, and Jim's reaction was he, he stunned. He said, no, I'm not looting it. I'm buying it to prevent it from leaving the country and I'm going to will it to the Cyan Society when I die. Uh, and the director did not like that answer at all, and he sent in the police to seize four uh, Thai Buddha heads that Jim owned, including the one that you see in the upper right. The quality of that head uh, is illustrated by the fact that it was just recently lent by the National Museum of Thailand to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for a number of months uh, for a show that they had. So that's the kind of thing that he was able to collect and that this director was upset about. They clearly hated each other and whether that escalated to uh, murder or kidnapping or something, unlikely but perhaps possible. Uh, he had an ex-lover, Lisa Lyons. She ended up living in his house for five months uh, after he disappeared, so perhaps she thus had access to his collections and looted them or something, I don't know. Uh, unlikely, but again, that might look, be looked into if this case happened today. There were communist terrorists uh, operating on the Thai-Malay border about 90 miles north of Tanarata, and they might have kidnapped him, but there was no note that was ever, there no ransom uh, was ever demanded. But they, this uh, headline here, Red Killed in Border Battle, this was just uh, a couple of weeks before he disappeared. So 90 miles away, there were some nasty people going on, uh, nasty things going on. And there's even more conspiracies. Um, one, of course, is that Malaysian gangs, which did have a history of kidnapping Chinese businessmen for ransom, might have kidnapped uh, Jim. But again, no ransom note was uh, forthcoming. And if you look at that red underlined bit, you see that it says that here's a memo to the director of the FBI stating that the police, probably the Malaysian police, have contacted all criminal and communist gangs in Malaysia and have received assurance that none of these groups had any knowledge pertinent to the victim's disappearance. So we can rule that one out. Uh, this is great investigative technique. Um, further down the, the memo, you see that it says that someone, probably the Thai police, have received reports from two sources, a reliable one in Bangkok and one from personnel at the hotel in the Cameron Highlands, uh, where the victim uh, is not known to have ever frequented or stayed, that the victim is homosexual. So there is this written evidence. Um, you know, remember, at this time, the FBI was absolutely uh, fascinated with everyone's sexual orientation. So, you know, whether or not this has anything to do with the case seems unlikely, but, but they felt that it was uh, likely enough that they wanted to look into it. So they felt that there might have been some homosexual lover. He was clearly bisexual if he had um, uh, in orientation, if this is accurate, because he had been married and he had numerous affairs, as I mentioned, with uh, various ladies. 
Now, in most cases, the first thing you would look at would be the main heir, but uh, his nephew, remember he had no children, so the nephew, Henry Thompson, was not really a viable suspect because he was a very wealthy stockbroker in New York. Uh, he was in New York when he heard about the disappearance. He heard about it on a ticker tape. And the first thing that he did was to uh, come to Thailand and actually set up a foundation um, to run the, to sort of as a memorial to uh, Jim Thompson. And he didn't liquidate the assets or do anything that a, a normal suspect would do. So he seems quite unlikely. And the ex-wife of uh, Jim was a, a model named Pat Thraves. Unfortunately, she was very sick and died soon after, and she was uh, virtually in a coma in Hawaii at the time of the disappearance, so she's not really a viable suspect. Oh, yes, in the upper right, you see a couple more suspects. There's the Nugan Hand Bank, a rogue CIA bank, uh, which I think some of our Australians in the audience have heard of because it's based in Australia. Um, and supposedly uh, that bank may have had, there's one author who pushes the idea that that, that bank had something to do with the disappearance. Well, that, that bank was really active more in the 70s than in 67, so that doesn't seem very uh, likely. And then there's the theory that business rivals, and another author pushes the theory that business rivals uh, here in Bangkok uh, had him murdered uh, for business reasons and that you can hire a murderer here, supposedly, uh, then and now for a very reasonable price. Um, so that's a possibility. Seems a little strange, though, that such a murderer would be commissioned from here and then would follow Jim to a place where he'd only really decided to go at the last minute. Not Hardly anybody knew that he was going there. He's staying at a very isolated location. How would the murderer surveil that location when it's on top of a hill, you know, strike at just the right time, um, dispose of the body, get away in a little town where virtually every stranger was noticed. So a lot of, lot of problems with that theory, although it's thrown out quite a bit. So the search went on for 11 days, all these conspiracy theories emerged, and then things started to die down. But just a couple of months later, in June 1967, a gentleman named Ed Pollitz, who actually knew J uh, Jim Thompson and was supposed to meet with Jim on the Monday after he disappeared in Singapore, uh, supposedly saw Jim in Tahiti at the uh, Hotel Tahiti. And on the right, you see the memo. Uh, I think this is the first time it's, you know, it's ever been uh, brought to light the actual memo which summarizes this uh, sighting. And Ed Pollitz was, quote, quite convinced that he had seen Jim Thompson in Tahiti, uh, but then when pushed said that he could have been a case of mistaken identity, but he was pretty sure. He says that he saw Jim sort of from the back. He was uh, 30 or 40 feet away across the hotel lobby. He was with a woman. Uh, Ed even called out, Jim. Jim, and the man kept walking away and got in a car and took off. Ed was so convinced that he'd seen him that he went around to the authorities and tried to find some paper trail, some evidence that Jim Thompson or somebody by that name had come to Tahiti. Uh, couldn't find anything. The Malaysian authorities, to their credit, sent down uh, an investigator. He also couldn't find any evidence that Jim had been there. And then the uh, niece of Jim Thompson and uh, some other family members went to Tahiti and checked it out. Couldn't find anything. By the way, this, um, this memo, the little cover note there, uh, shows that this citing report was circulated throughout state and then uh, was sent over to CIA or was recommended to be sent to Bill Colby at CIA, who was the the Asian director at the time, and later, of course, became a famous uh, director of the CIA. So that more CIA connections. Now there's yet another theory put out by this gentleman here, Captain Philip Rivers. He was a Singapore policeman. He had a merchant marine captain. Uh, those are his pictures uh, that you see there. He lives in the Cameron Highlands, took an interest in the case. And he said that he thinks that the bones of Jim Thompson were found many years later uh, and that Jim had been hit by a speeding truck, 
not far from the Moonlight Bungalow, that the driver was so, uh, you know, was discombobulated, but not so discombobulated that he didn't, uh, wasn't able to put the body in the back of the truck, drive the truck about 10 miles north of the scene of the crime, uh, buried the body, and then the bones were found many years later. So this sounded pretty credible. Uh, and in the massive report that I wrote on this, uh, you can actually read his 10-page uh, analysis. Uh, and sounds plausible, but when I was able to track down the uh, deputy medical director who actually had the bones in his possession, and he said, yes, I had bones, but I was never able to establish that they were human bones, um, which is kind of important. And, uh, and there's no real connection that he could see between those bones and the uh, Jim Thompson case. They might have been anybody's bones or any animal's bones. So to me, that sort of shot that, that one out of the water. I would put that down at very, very low probability. There have been four books uh, written about Jim Thompson and sort of on the case, but most of them just rehash Jim Thompson's life and rehash all these conspiracy theories. Um, and probably the best one, if you want, if you want to read something uh, other than my report, which of course is required reading, um, is uh, the one in the upper left by William Warren, uh, who was a friend of Jim's, and uh, the William Warren Library is named after him. Uh, he was a, he's a terrific person and wrote a very good book about it. And he actually acknowledges that there may, uh, there's a decent chance that it was just an accident in the jungle. And, and uh, he doesn't describe the search in detail, and in fact, none of these have more than a page or two about the search itself. So that's where I figured maybe I could make a contribution because I know a little something about search and rescue. So I would figured I would look into this. So let's do that. So that, of course, involves having some research questions. What obstacles did the search encounter? What was the quality and quantity of the search? What's the probability of success, or POS? That's a technical term in um, search and rescue uh, of that search. What can we do in terms of citing causes or eliminating causes and witnesses? Um, and what was Jim Thompson like as a search subject? So I went to the Cameron Highlands and was luckily uh, able to track down some of the people who had been involved in the 1967 search. I was very fortunate, especially in the upper right, Captain Mohammed had then been a lieutenant in the Malaysian Army, uh, and he was a search leader. So he was privy to their tactics, their strategy, and this was just fantastic that he happened to be in town and I happened to come across him. Um, otherwise, I might have missed him, and he was a great responder. I also interviewed uh, Mahdi, whose house had been searched. Um, give you an idea, he was a young uh, child when he recalls his father was a, an army doctor in the Royal Army Medical Corps, and a policeman came, kicked open the door, and stormed in and searched under the bed and in the closet and everywhere for uh, Jim Thompson. Um, so that's some of the searching that was going on. Another. Excellent uh, respondent was Lieutenant uh, Dennis Horgan. He was a U.S. Army search observer, and so he was privy to some of the tactics and strategy there. And he, of course, later became a famous editor of the Bangkok World and wrote a good book called The Bangkok World, which I recommend. In the lower right, you see me and some Malaysian police staff, and of course, I interviewed the Malaysian police uh, about this case and talked to them. and. I said, so what is your theory on the Jim Thompson case? And I was talking to the commandant of that region, and he said, who's Jim Thompson? So uh, I was kind of appalled to learn that they throw out all of their missing person cases after 15 years. They just throw, literally throw all the files away. So he had no idea who Jim Thompson was or what is arguably the most famous disappearance in Malaysian history. He'd never heard of. So what are some of the obstacles that were encountered uh, in the search? Well, the first is the terrain itself. If you look at this map, you see all those contour lines. Those are all those wiggly uh, hills that I was telling you about. Very, very difficult to search in. And then, of course, on top of the uh, hills, you've got very thick jungle. As you so see in the lower part of the slide, 
that is a so-called trail. That's the Jim Thompson Mystery Trail. And you see it's more like an animal track uh, running through the jungle. And that's one of the, my guides, uh, the respondent uh, Mahdi, a naturalist uh, from a local hotel. So their idea of a trail is not what you'd find in the National Park Service in the United States uh, or in a developed park uh, here. Here's a close-up of a map. This is probably the map that was used by the searchers themselves. This was a map put together in 1963. And, uh, Good quality, uh, very detailed. As you can see, you can see the actual moonlight bungalow is there at the end of the red lines. And you see the access road that goes up to the moonlight bungalow, and then the kitchen trail that I was talking about goes out the back. Now the blue line, if you look at the left, that blue line is where Jim Thompson and his host, Dr. Ling, on the day before Jim disappeared, this, so this is on the Saturday, they left the Moonlight Bungalow and decided to hike cross country to the golf course, which remember is only half a mile away, within sight, uh, south-southeast of the Moonlight Bungalow. They figured it would just take them a half an hour or something to get there. Four hours later, they stumbled onto the golf course, uh, exhausted. Uh, Dr. Ling had sprained his leg and was kind of shaken by this experience, uh, and he so uh, apparently vowed to never go hiking with Jim Thompson again. Um, Jim's reaction was quite different. Jim was exhilarated by this. And that, to me, is really, really strange. I mean, how many search subjects do you find that are exhilarated by getting lost in the jungle? I mean, that, that to me, is sort of gives an indication of his state of mind, that maybe he was seeking uh, some sort of youthful... Uh, connection with his OSS experiences, uh, that, that kind of thing. So very unusual. I was able to identify all the key search locations. There were uh, nine eyewitnesses who claimed that they saw Jim after he left the Moonlight Bungalow. And so using Google Earth, which is a fantastic tool, I was able to get exact lat longs down to the centimeter practically of where all these people were. And I was able to um, identify who they were, where they were, how far away they were, uh, they were when they saw Jim. And I was able to eliminate two of them because they were over 200 yards away uh, from Jim when they supposedly uh, saw him. For instance, in the lower right, uh, Mahdi said that he had an auntie, probably not a relative, just a, an older woman, who saw Jim get into a car at that location, uh, and the car had many soldiers in it. And there are many, many stories like this that have popped up over the years. So I, I have to discount these because he was not able to remember the name of the person. Of course, the person has died since. Not, it can't be cross-examined. Cross so I like facts and being able to interview people and uh, figures and that kind of thing. And this case doesn't have a lot of that. I won't go into all the details of this, but it is possible to uh, analyze the case geographically pretty carefully. And unfortunately, these witnesses after the last known point, the, uh, the Moonlight Bungalow, are mostly of low uh, credibility. Uh, one servant said that she saw Jim Thompson sitting on that stone that you see in the upper left and the center uh, upper portion, that's me, uh, beside the stone. And that witness was maybe a little more credible because she said that she was just a few yards away, and she saw uh, this fellow. And the, the cook in the lower right uh, claims that she saw Jim uh, a few hundred yards from the Moonlight Bungalow. So this is possible. As I mentioned, I was able to impeach two witnesses as too far away to have recognized him. Now, another thing that nobody had ever been able to do before was, uh, or even attempted, was to analyze how big the search was. So using press accounts and talking to um, Captain Muhammad, I was able to come up with a very rough estimate, sort of order of magnitude estimate of the size of the search. And day by day, I won't go through all the details, but you'll see uh, day by day I've got an estimate of the number of person days, sort of eight hour person days that were devoted to the search and come up with a total of around 1,400, 1,500 person days, which is a really huge effort. 
So to their credit, they did a lot, and they did it for a long time, 11 days. That's, that's a lot. Uh, however, Captain Mohammed told me that they used bloodhounds, as you see in the lower left. Uh, now, that's not what we consider a bloodhound, but um, it's, you know, uh, dogs are pretty fantastic tools, and you don't have to be an actual bloodhound in order to do bloodhound-type work. Um, and he pointed that dog out as the kind that they used. And no other writer had ever interviewed Captain Muhammad, and nobody had ever found out that three bloodhounds like this were used and trailed Jim's scent all around the moonlight bungalow at the top of the hill, but were not able to trail his scent down the kitchen trail or any other trail or down the, um, the access road. So that would seem to indicate that he did not go for a little hike and maybe was picked up by a car which would, of course, support all of these conspiracy theories. So that sounds pretty good. And that they figured that out within the first two or three days. And they sort of fixated on that. And even though they kept searching in the jungle, I think they, were, they had what's called scenario lock, which is that they were focused on that scenario that, he, that it was a conspiracy, not a, uh, a jungle disappearance. So what could be wrong with that? Uh, that theory. Well, dogs make mistakes. I've interviewed uh, search dog handlers who did exactly these kinds of searches with bloodhounds, and they say that you have to ha handle the scent material very well. You have to scent, uh, handlers have to really know what they're doing. Uh, it is possible to, uh, for them to make a mistake about a break. Um, there were no eyewitnesses or ear witnesses who saw any car come up. Uh, and a car, remember this is a very isolated, quiet area, a car coming up those, uh, that steep hill would make a little noise, it would have to turn around, there would be some doors closing or slamming. Nobody heard anything like that, but they did hear gravel crunching, so problems with that theory. But still, that is a, a very interesting idea. So how big was the area that needed to be searched? Well, in the left portion, Inside the bright yellow line, you see the area that Captain Muhammad said were the real was the real focus area. And that is a three-mile radius extending out into the jungle um, from the Moonlight Bungalow. The lower right quadrants were, uh, you know, were in Tanarata itself, so there was search, uh, searching done there as, you know, that story I told you before where they kicked open the, uh, the Quonset hut door and searched under the bed. Uh, but, you know, the real jungle searching was done in the, uh, in, to the west and southwest of the uh, Moonlight Bungalow. So you do the math and that comes out to 17 square miles that needed to be searched intensively. That's a lot. I mean, I have trouble finding my keys in my house sometimes in the morning, uh, and that's not 17 square miles. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big chunk of jungle to search. If you extend it out six miles, you get 70 square miles needed to be searched. That's huge. And he could have kept walking um, uh, during the moonlight uh, and you know, after, even after the search began. The only known photo of the search is shown in the right. And there you see the searchers are fairly close together. You see this is a sort of clearing in the jungle. And notice how thick the brush is. It's coming up to their waist. And then over to the left, you see the the single canopy jungle that they have there. So it's not triple canopy, that's important. Triple canopy jungle has very open uh, nature uh, down at the ground level because there's so many layers uh, that block the sunlight from letting the plants grow. But single canopy, you get a lot of this dense undergrowth which makes it very difficult if, you, if there are clues or a man uh, lying uh, under the growth. So I figure with some reasonable assumptions that only about 11 square miles was searched uh, of those 17.7 square miles that needed to be searched. In other words, I, using uh, some assumptions about spacing and using formula from the US uh, National Association for Search and Rescue, I came up with this number of 11, which is a guesstimate. Uh, if that guesstimate is anywhere right, then that means that only about 56% of the needed search effort was delivered. Now, there was an alternate estimate. A searcher at the time was quoted as saying, a search leader at the time was saying, 
To do this search right, I would have needed a regiment of men for a month. And that's a lot of men. That's 1,600 men times 31 days. That's 49,000 person days. So if that's right, then only 3% of the needed effort was delivered. So that, that's, uh, I think that's fairly significant. You need to, we're going to learn a little bit about search and rescue here. Modern search and rescue is a lot better than it was uh, back in 1967, thank goodness, and we've developed the concept of probability of detection, POD, uh, and that's problematic. So if I'm a, let's say I'm a segment leader, I'm out there and I'm searching and you're my boss, and I come back to you after I've searched and you say, okay, what'd you do? And I say, oh, well, you gave me a search segment, you know, bounded here and there by this road and that uh, terrain, and I searched the entire thing. So I had a search coverage of one, one 100%. So therefore, my probability of detection should be 100%, right? No, not at all. The National Association of Search and Rescue has established through lots of studies that it's really a logarithmic function, as shown in the lower left, where if you have a coverage of one, as is shown in that little arrow, your probability of detection is only about 63%. So suppose I say to you, boss, uh, okay, I wanna get 100%. I'm gonna go out there and search it twice. Even then, you only get up to about 84% because you can never really reach 100%. Why is that? Because searchers make mistakes, they're looking the wrong way, they get tired, it's hot as hell out there. Um, for instance, look at the photo in the right. Anybody see anything there? What do we got? All right, excellent. You're a good searcher. Uh, in the lower left, there's a baseball cap on its side. But it'd be pretty easy to miss that if you're staggering along. It's uh, almost 100% humidity. Um, that is a clue. And remember, you're not really looking for the victim. You're looking for clues to the victim because there's only one victim, but there may be um, hundreds of clues scattered across the landscape. Now, another concept you need to understand is probability of area. This is the probability that your search subject or the clues are in the search subject, or the search segment that you are looking at, uh, rather than in some other one. But you you've carved up the landscape into these uh, segments. And to get probability of success, POS, you just multiply probability of detection times probability of area. So I came up with a high and a low estimate. And this is sort of the first ever quantitative analysis showing that the probability of success, I think, was 47 to 30% or less uh, that this search was adequate and, success and, and would have been successful. Why do, I, why do I say or less? Well, because there were a number of flaws in the search execution that I think were uh, significant. But before we get to those, let's talk about one other neat thing that's happened since 1967. Uh, and that is this guy shown in the picture on the left, Robert Kester, a terrific fellow. He has created the International Search and Rescue Incident Database with 16,000 cases uh, in it. And it's a fantastic resource. So by looking at that, you can statistically see what's likely to happen in search and rescue uh, issues. Of course, this doesn't tell you what happened in your particular case, but statistically it helps you, guide you. So if you look in the uh, center top, the ladies in the audience will not be surprised to know that the typical person wandering out there lost and uh, alone is a man. Uh, and that's that tall, uh, thing there with the star on top showing that that's the vast majority of cases are males out there. Uh, if you look in the upper right, there are 5,900 cases of males in the database and only 3% yielded absolutely no trace uh, found, which is what we have here in the Jim Thompson case. So the Jim Thompson case is very unusual in that regard. Uh, in the center right, you see that according to the database, it's quite likely that Jim Thompson's body is within four, uh, four miles of the last known point or the initial planning point. Um, so that's, you know, pretty close. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing, uh, but just statistically speaking. 
And everybody thinks that people who are lost always go downhill and follow drainages, but actually that's a myth. Uh, quite a few uh, people who are lost actually stay at the same level or even go uphill. Um, so Jim's body, if it's out there in the jungle, could be lower or higher. And that uh, in the center bottom, you see the length of the search is not related to the distance from the last known point or the initial planning point. In other words, just because the search went on for 11 days and is one of the longest searches in uh, Asian history does not mean that, he's that he wandered 50 miles away. He could be within three or four miles of the, uh, the bungalow. And as I said before, the, the search was atypically long. Most searches end, 97% uh, of searches end within a day or two. So some of the issues with the search. Uh, these were folks who generally had very low training in, and experience in search and rescue. Uh, and there was one real problem that I found when Captain Muhammad told me that they did no searching beyond 200 yards of the trails. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that they went up the main trail and then if there was a side trail, they'd go off on the side trail and the guys would fan out at a certain distance apart and search 200 yards on either side of the side trail. If they didn't find anything, that is they didn't see any clues, any broken branches or anything like that, then they'd come back to the side trail, go back to the main trail, go up to the next side trail and so on. So you can see that they're missing huge parts of the jungle by doing that. They were, they were uh, sort of confident that they could spot clues like broken twigs or footprints or something like that. Um, I don't know. I, I, think, I think there's a problem here. Uh, there was no attempt to block the trails. That's where in modern search and rescue you'd figure out what's the maximum distance that the person can go and you put some teams uh, at all the trail heads uh, right there to block uh, where the people are. Another serious error is that they brought in the top mystic in the world, Peter Herkos, the most famous guy of the century, supposedly, in terms of this, uh, and he helped shape the investigation. So he was actually advising them. He was inside the search and advising some of the people, and to me that's just a terrible blunder that you would never allow to happen uh, today. And as I mentioned, there was a scenario of block. Um, bottom bullet point, there were many disparate searchers all kinds of organizations were involved. There was uh, all the different agencies, but there were volunteers, there were Boy Scouts, there were patients at a local hospital, there were Orang Asli, a uh, local uh, Aborigine uh, people who were very skilled in jungle, uh, uh, in the, living in the jungle, and the mystics and so on. So uh, what happens when you bring all of those kind of people together, and I've studied this mathematically, is that the bigger the search, the less likely it is that it's going to be a good search. And if you think about it, just common sense, when you get all of these different agencies and people, none of whom have ever communicated before, they're actually literally speaking different languages, what are the chances that they're all going to be able to coordinate all this and document it properly and report back every evening and as to what they covered? Pretty low. So I wrote an article back in 1989 showing that if a search or an emergency is 10 times larger than the next largest one, it has 150 times more likely chance to have major communication and uh, management problems. And you can see this in Hurricane Katrina and other you know, major disasters that uh, we've encountered around the world. So Jim Thompson himself is a search subject, is very unusual. He left behind his wallet, his money, his passports, his medications, he had a serious gallbladder problem and he was supposed to have gallbladder pills with him at all time. he left at times, he left those behind. He would have a gallbladder attack about every six months and he said that it hurt so badly that he thought he was dying the first time that he had such an attack. Uh, he left behind his cigarettes but he was a chain smoker. Now that's pretty strange. Uh, he left behind his driving license. Uh, and he made a number of blunders in the two or three days just before he departed Bangkok. Um, for instance, he didn't fill out the right paperwork to leave the country, and that had to be fixed at the airport at the last minute. So he almost didn't make it on this trip. He took no gear, no canteen. He didn't tell people where he was going. His health was not great. Um, he really wasn't in good shape. 
and he was clearly a little depressed. His doctor said he wasn't suicidal, but he, he clearly wasn't enjoying life the way he did when back in his youthful days at the OSS. So I think it's possible that he was sort of taking risks just to enjoy the taking of risks. Uh, maybe, maybe he was experiencing a little early dementia, not sure. We can eliminate some of the causes, about half of the causes that were cited in the press at the time. Uh, leopard attacks, luckily there are no leopards in the uh, Cameron Highlands, so you don't have to worry about that. You go there. Uh, the press said that he fell into a cave, that he fell into quicksand, that there were snapping traps that snapped shut on his leg. Well, there actually are none of those in the Cameron Highlands. Um, there's one theory that he, the Orang Asli, the local uh, folks, had a pit trap that he fell into, uh, and then he was injured or killed, and then they covered it up. Possible, but this guy, Noon, um, who came in, questioned the Orang Asli very carefully, and it seems unlikely that in 50 years since then, none of them would have, that the word wouldn't have gotten out uh, from these people. Uh, and they're very peaceful, quiet uh, folks. They are not some of the headhunters of Borneo or something like that. Uh, I think we've covered some of these others. Uh, some things need to be added. His close associates uh, might have done something to him, perhaps. Uh, and then the bottom one, the Widowmaker Limbs. Actually, the Special Air Service Regiment, the uh, British Special Forces, was active in uh, the Malay Emergency back in the uh, 50s and 60s. And what they feared the most was not the communist terrorists that they were fighting, but falling limbs and trees. And more of them and more British soldiers were killed by falling trees than by uh, communist terrorists. So could be lying under a tree. And there are various causes that remain. Uh, snake bite is possible, but actually statistically it's not very likely. Only a minority of snakes in Malaysia are venomous. And I didn't know this until I got into this case. If you're bitten by a venomous snake, the chances are that your venom will not go into you. They only envenomate when they're really uh, threatened. And uh, the majority of cases are dry defensive bites. And then even if you get envenomated, you have a decent chance of surviving. So you put all those together and statistically it's quite possible, but not likely. Uh, kidnapping by local gangs, I think we've already talked about some of these. Um, intentional disappearance on his own, possible, but very unlikely. There's no money trail. There's no evidence uh, other than that sighting uh, in Tahiti. Uh, no evidence of him showing up anywhere else. So what do I think? I think statistically and probabilistically, there was just an accident in the jungle. He was walking along cross country like he shouldn't have been doing. Tripped over a root, broke his neck, broken arm, was incapacitated and the body was missed by the search. Uh, or perhaps he had a gallbladder attack uh, or um, he also had intermittent amoebic dysentery, which is not pleasant. So that's my analysis of the case and then we'll turn now for a minute to the murder of Jim's sister in Pennsylvania and the current case. So remember there was the sighting in Tahiti and then things quieted down and then in August Jim's sister was brutally murdered in Pennsylvania right on the Delaware border. She was a society matron. She lived alone in this mansion that you see. She had two very large guard dogs uh, but she was brutally stabbed and beaten to death. Uh, it was just a horrible crime scene with blood everywhere uh, and nothing was stolen and there was no Evidence, uh, no clues were, in, uh, were found, and the case is still unsolved. The neighbors that I was able to interview say that at the time, they thought that communist terrorists from this part of the world had gone all the way over there to terrorize and kill her in order to uh, terrify Jim, whom they were holding, into denouncing the Vietnam War or something like that. At the time, that seemed credible, and there were, this was, there were even newspaper accounts on that. Today, it seems a little uh, less likely that they would reach out so far and uh, that they would be interested in doing that. I don't know, possible, but it seems unlikely. Uh, I did interview at length the cold case officer from the Pennsylvania State Police who has jurisdiction over this. He wouldn't show me all the files, 
but he actually walked me through what was in the files for about two hours, and so I'm, I'm confident that I know what's, what's in there. And what's in there is that, as he said, well, we have no proof against anybody, but we just kind of keep circling back to her son. Uh, unfortunately, he is a suspect, or at least a person of interest, especially because he committed suicide uh, four years later. The suicide note did not mention his mother, but mentioned um, uh, financial difficulties. And there are other possible suspects uh, shown in the lower left. One suspect is if you believe that Jim Thompson self disappeared, um, perhaps he hightailed it over to Pennsylvania and you know he didn't get along with his sister actually. They had a lot of spats, so perhaps he killed him. There was a gang that was the Johnson gang that was uh, active in that area, but they were really active a few years later and they tended to kill each other rather than killing their victims. So uh, the MO doesn't really fit. Pennsylvania State Police were really keen on that one, but they just couldn't prove. So that case is still unsolved. And another sad unsolved case, which just happened recently, just a few months ago, is this wonderful gentleman, Forrest Gann, a biologist and mountaineer who'd been to this part of the world, the Cameron Highlands, uh, exactly where Jim disappeared. Um, he went up there again looking for that flower. That is a flower on the left side called Raffalensia. And uh, it's the biggest flower in the world, and it smells like rotting meat. I can't make this stuff up. Uh, and he went looking for that, and he disappeared, sadly. And his uh, family was looking for him, and they even contacted me, and I gave them some advice uh, on search strategy and tactics and so on, but was not able to really help them. And it's, it's clear now that he is uh, deceased. So by the way, when I was in the Cameron Highlands, I was sitting, um, studying my notes. I was about to go to interview the police uh, commandant, and I got a knock on my window, and it was two Americans who looked really disheveled, and they said, please, please give us a ride back to our hotel, and I said, well, I'm, I'm really going the other way, but then I looked at them, and they clearly needed a ride. They were two hikers who, he had been a Peace Corps volunteer in that area many years before. They went hiking. Within 20 minutes, they'd gotten lost in the jungle. They staggered around in the jungle for about four or five hours, staggered out onto the road, saw my car, and knocked on my window. So the moral of the story is don't go wandering alone out in the jungle in the Cameron Highlands if you go there. So conclusions and implications. Well, uh, one thing is what's, what would happen if this case was solved tomorrow? Well, if Jim Thompson self disappeared, I think the Americans would be a little embarrassed because we didn't track him down. Uh, if his CIA file was opened uh, and ties were revealed between Jim and the Thai government, which uh, would almost certainly occur, I think both the U.S. and Thai government would be uh, embarrassed. Uh, if he was murdered by communists, um, especially if they were uh, Chinese-inspired, the Chinese might be a little embarrassed. If he was murdered by Thai business rivals, uh, that would be pretty embarrassing because some of these business rivals are very, very important people. So I think what all the governments would like is the bottom line where Jim Thompson just remains unfound uh, and we are stuck with the status quo. I'm not so happy with that one. Though. So what can be done at this point? Anything? Yes. If I'm right, the statistical probability is that he's, his remains are out there in the jungle, then there are steps you can use in modern uh, search and rescue to solve this case. One would be, first, would be uh, scenario development. You get an expert who's done this many times before who carves up the terrain into various segments. You do Matson voting. That's where you do secret ballot voting to, uh, of search experts who analyze the case and they say, okay, we think there's a 30% chance that he's in this area, 20% here, 10% here, 0% here. And then that, you mush those together and you come up with a probability heat map. In other words, that's what these maps are. And that means the most likely areas are shown in red and the next most likely in bright yellow and then uh, say on the right, that's uh, ocean out there. So that's a, uh, an example of a probability heat map. Uh, these are actual examples of some 
probability heat maps done by the best people in the world, uh, Metron Corporation, little outfit in San Diego, uh, which is the outfit that found uh, Air France 447, the one that went down in the South Atlantic about five years ago. Uh, they're the ones who probably should have been hired to look for this um, missing airplane in the uh, Southeast Indian Ocean, the Malaysian aircraft, but were not hired. Uh, a mistake, if you ask me. That, that I think the Australian government made a boo-boo there. So, um, oh, and then you'd use cadaver dogs uh, to actually search the high probability areas. You see a cadaver dog in the upper right. That dog is actually searching for a body underwater. That's how talented and amazing these dogs are. Uh, when a body's underwater, it creates a little you know, bubbles. Not so nice. And those rise to the top, and they form a V, and you get the dog into that V, and then he can narrow it down. He signals to go down there. You send down the divers, and you have a good chance of finding the body. Of course, they can do that on land, too, and they can even distinguish um, animal bone from human bone, even little tiny slivers of bone. Absolutely amazing uh, uh, research tool. So conclusions, I think the search was large but insufficient and somewhat flawed. Uh, I think a conspiracy is possible but less likely and that he might be findable and that means that the murder in Pennsylvania is probably not connected to Jim Thompson's disappearance. Another conclusion shown in the lower right is that search and rescue is often not done well. Uh, even today, uh, all of these fancy techniques that I've been talking about and mathematical analysis, this is at the high end of search and rescue. And a lot of search and rescue today is done the same way as it was back in 1967. And it's just as flawed. So uh, the conclusion there is if you're out hiking, be sure, and, and you get lost, be sure you get lost in a jurisdiction that is well-funded <laughs> and really knows what they're doing. So be safe out there in the wild. Uh, if you want to read more, I've got four stories on my website here, themosttraveled.com, about this, summarizing it, uh, and also that massive report, which has, the reason it's so long is it has 550 pages of all of the documentation that I was able to find in the annexes. So you'd only have to read about 100 pages. So thank you very much, and good hunting. Thank you very much, Lou. That was fascinating. What a fact-finding mission. Uh, we were going to open the mics, uh, or the one mic we have, up for some questions, some house rules. Um, please go ahead and ask a question and not make a statement. Um, and please identify yourself if you're a member here. We'd like to know uh, who you are. And uh, if you are a journalist, please let us know who uh, you publish with. So please go ahead. Uh, I'm the, I'm a life member, I'm a publisher. Uh, you mentioned everything meticulously, but I missed the, that you met, you didn't mention the two CIA helicopters which uh, came from Bangkok immediately when it was known that he disappeared. And uh, he wanted to meet somebody and it seems he had some documents on something and uh, you didn't mention uh, this. So if you, uh, if you uh, look at uh, murders and where family murders happen, uh, in which kind of business uh, would that happen? Uh, for sure not a normal business. But uh, um, he was uh, um, investigating something he had some some documents on on uh, on somebody on on a, uh, and uh, it's most likely that the CIA covered up for that and uh, I like to maybe a, a little bit correction of why the fine arts department was not so happy with him uh, he removed some stuccos from a, uh, from a cave and uh, that was not, uh, maybe, I don't know whether he personally did it or he hired somebody, but definitely that was uh, not completely legal. So that was the reason why they were so mad at him. Okay, okay thank you. So uh, in order, the helicopter question, um, there were, uh, if you read all of the stuff in the background, uh, you know, in the back of my report, I have uh, clips from 
the contemporaneous time. And they do mention uh, U.S. Army helicopters. They don't mention CIA helicopters, but there are uh, talk about foreign helicopters. I ask um, the uh, U.S. Army lieutenant who went down there, you know, later um, who became the newspaper man about that, and he said, no, that w all of those press reports were wrong, that there were some helicopters that were used, but they were only used for about two hours, and they were local Malaysian helicopters. They uh, searched the jungle for only about two hours because the jungle canopy was so thick that they were basically useless. Uh, now, I have heard stories like what the gentleman mentioned about helicopters and, and CIA sending helicopters. Remember, getting a helicopter to go um, hundreds and hundreds of miles is not cheap, not easy, um, uh, takes a while, and so on. So it is possible. I have never seen any evidence of that. If I could, uh, if the gentleman could supply um, some evidence of that, I would be happy to put it in my report and, uh, and make a correction because certainly what I have created is not uh, perfect and I, I want it to be accurate uh, so I could have an addendum. Uh, in terms of documents, uh, again, heard stories. I've never seen any proof that I could come up with uh, that he was um, investigating or that he had some sort of secret documents on him. Uh, what, what most people seem to think was that he was kind of out of the loop because of perhaps his, invest, uh, his opposition to the Vietnam War. He wasn't really uh, hooked up with the uh, Vietnam. I mean, uh, Horgan said a younger generation was sailing the ship now, and Jim was sort of out of it. Um, there might have been some investigation, and there was an investigation of two major thefts that happened in Jim Thompson's um, company, and he had found out that uh, one of his most trusted employees was stealing a lot of money, and he even brought it before the board of directors, so that might be something of what, what you've heard, but uh, that person apparently stayed with the company, and Jim just decided to keep him on. Uh, the, let's see, I think you mentioned a cave. Was that, uh, what was the, um, I think there was one other uh, point the that you made. The fine arts department. Oh, sorry, the fine arts department, thank you. Oh, yes, in the cave. Actually, I was up at that cave um, just uh, this past weekend, and it's on top of a mountain, and my thighs are still burning. It's, it's just unbelievably difficult uh, climbing up there. Uh, so what happened there was, as I've uh, been able to establish and, and write in the report, was that, yes, he obtained some heads which had been in this cave. This is Cave Tamarat, which is near Sitep. It's about 130 miles north-northeast of here. You can go there and visit it, uh, but you need to be in good shape. <laughs> I almost didn't make it. Um, and there are a number of Buddha heads, which all of which have been cut away, and there's just the sort of shadow of them left. Uh, and that's one of the Buddha heads that I showed uh, earlier. He came into possession of those through purchase of them, uh, and I've got in his letters, um, his previously unpublished letters, 200 pages of them, are in the back of the report. So you can actually see what he says about those heads and how he acquired them. And he's very upset uh, about what happened. So you can read his actual words. And what he says is that he was, um, uh, that he was trying to hold on to these heads to give them to the Siam Society uh, and, and so forth. And that led to the big uh, dispute and the seizure eventually. So hopefully that does it. Uh, questions? Other questions? Yep. Other questions? questions? Big crowd, no questions. Oh, yeah. somebody in the back. Please come okay. to the mic. Uh, hi, I'm a student member. Um, I just wonder if you could expand upon who commissioned the reports, why they commissioned the reports, and why now? So reports meaning my reports? Your, your reports. Okay, thank you. Um, well, you're looking at them. I commissioned the reports. I paid for them. Um, I just uh, don't like mysteries that are unsolved. And I'm uh, semi-retired and have some time on my hands and some resources and have always been interested in this case. So uh, I decided to look into it several years ago. It had always been sort of on my bucket list. Uh, and as a consultant, 
you know, I'm sort of in the business of churning out reports, so um, it was, you know, uh, easy for me in, in a sense. Uh, I think the real reason that I, that I did it was to try to elevate the level of discourse about this case. Remember, the 50th anniversary is coming up in just a few months. And there are probably going to be a lot of stories in the press about uh, this case. And they're probably going to be like the stories in the 25th anniversary, and the 30th anniversary, and the 40th anniversary. And they're pretty crummy stories, frankly. They're not, I don't think, at a very high journalistic level. And they're just. You know, well, we went down there and we interviewed, uh, we tried to find this uh, a taxi driver who uh, went searching for Jim and the taxi driver wouldn't talk to us and uh, ha ha, you know, wonder where Jim is, maybe he's in Tahiti, uh, okay, and then they adjourned to Mahogany Ridge. So I, I really didn't want that to happen, so that's why I um, uh, did this and uh, you can, by the way, the report is free, you can download it uh, and the stories are all on my website for free. No. Too much hassle to sell things like this. I'd rather just uh, have it out there in public. So, other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jonathan Miller. I am a journalist with Channel 4 News from the UK. One of those crummy journalists who's planning a, um, a story <laughs> in a few months' time um, for the 50th anniversary. However, um, I would like to plead that I, I, I might be able to provide something slightly different from the crummy usual. Great. Because I grew up in the Cameron Highlands. Super. And um, I, my family lived there for 15 years, and we arrived in, in 1969, two years after Jim, exactly two years after Jim Thompson disappeared. Um, I actually grew up about a mile away from the, from the spot that the, the cook, Fatima, last saw him. And um, as a child, I used to cycle down that road and see the rock that you sat on, and we used to call it Jim Thompson Corner. Um, the, the, the bungalow moonlight was just a, a stone's throw from, you know, because, you know, when you talk about a half mile to the golf course, you rightly talk about these windy roads which take you around the, the, the jungle. Um, and it takes a long time to walk these, these routes, even though by, that by the crow flies it's a short distance. There, there, there are two things which I would like to, to ask you, though. Um, just because they were, I mean, I, I am no expert. I've, I've read uh, a couple of those books. Um, because I'm fascinated. But there are two things which I am, I'm interested just to ask you. Number one is that although you say that there were no recorded tiger attacks since uh, the 19, 1920s or something, um, there was a tiger in the Cameron Highlands at that time. In the um, dry season, uh, the tigers, which were actually, they're called Kalantan tigers, and they come from the northeast of the peninsula, and they come high up into the mountains because they're searching for, for food and water. and. Uh, there were kids at the school at which my, my father was a, was a headmaster um, who, um, uh, who saw one of these tigers coming out of a jungle trail. It was just, it was less than a mile from where, where Thompson was last seen. Um, and I just wondered if you, if you heard any more about that because there was a tiger up there at the time and I know that because it ate our school dog. <laughs> um, the, the, second, the second thing well, is, there was, a <laughs> okay. there was a theory. I, d I hadn't heard about that. That's, okay, that's, well, I can, I can put important. you in touch with the people who will tell you all about it. Okay. Um, but there was a theory as well. And can I just say that I found your talk really fascinating and forensic and, and, and meticulous, as, as, our, as one of our earlier questioners uh, said. Um, there was a theory, though, which I heard as a child, which I haven't heard you mention. That, and and as, you, as you rightly say, Tanarata, the little local town, was was a one-horse town. I mean, it, there were just some shops up one side, side of the street. It was, it was tiny. It was, it was about 200 yards long. And uh, you couldn't get into the Cameron Hines without going down Main Street. Everybody saw you. Everybody had a look at what car was, in, was new in town. Everybody knew every single car that was up there. And so a new one was spotted. And two cars were spotted on a Sunday um, in April 1967 um, at, a, at a taxi stop there. And they were Thai taxis. And Thai taxis are very very rare sightings in the Cameron Highlands. Occasionally, they would come up bringing people all the way from Thailand. Jim Thompson, when he came down from Penang, actually caught a, um, a Malaysian taxi, then changed in, in, in um, uh, Tapa at the bottom of the mountain to come up. But these were Thai taxis, which were reportedly spotted. Did you ever hear about this yourself? Okay. Thanks a lot. OK, thank you. And uh, good luck with the uh, investigation. And uh, I do hope that you find uh, something uh, significant. So on the tigers, um, yes, there, w there are tigers still, and there were tigers then uh, in the Cameron Highlands. 
Tigers, I uh, looked into this a bit, tigers have a range of 10 by 10 miles. Uh, so they will, and they sort of protect that territory. So again, statistically, it's not very likely that he would have run into this, uh, into a tiger. Uh, again, that close to, uh, to town, but it is, it is certainly possible. I asked everyone that I could uh, interview about tigers because, you know, that's a kind of romantic way to go, I suppose, if you have to go. Um, so I, was, I knew everybody would be interested. And I was never able to find anyone who, would s who could cite a specific instance of any person being killed uh, by a tiger in the Cameron Highlands except perhaps back in the 1920s, but even that was a, sort of a perhaps. So if something hasn't happened for a century, the chances are that it's probably not gonna happen to Jim Thompson, but it's possible. And so I don't wanna discount that completely, but it, it's possible. I kinda believe in the KISS, simple, uh, the KISS system, right? Keep it simple, stupid. And so I like to look at the most likely things, uh, but acknowledge that other things are possibilities. The cars is interesting, and I had not heard, um, I don't think about the two Thai taxis. What I have heard is a story of a sort of caravan of black limousines coming down into town and then uh, going up to a helicopter pad and a helicopter taking off. But no one will ever come forward and, and actually say that they saw that, that everyone has heard that story. And, uh, William Warren in his book tackles that story and says that it was investigated and discounted. I would like to hear more about the taxis and to get some kind of written evidence on that. That would be interesting and uh, that would be something new that I would like to add to my report. Um, but you've got to remember that the rumors that started spreading, oh, by the way, some of the rumors were spread by the 118 mystics that showed up um, to help investigate uh, the case, in addition to the most famous mystic in the world who showed up. So that's the kind of thing that got started. So thank you. Okay. All right, Four. next to the mic, please. Thank you, my name is Siegfried Herzog, regular member. Um, thank you for a fascinating analysis, and I, um, I agree, I think uh, it's very convincing. Just for the sake of argument, Jim Thompson was trained um, in secret, uh, secret service things. So if he wanted to disappear, of course he would leave behind his wallet and his passport. You can put additional cash in your pocket and you can take additional medication uh, and you probably would have a fake passport anyway. And you probably also would think beforehand not to leave a money trail. So I'm not quite convinced about uh, the significance of, of that. Um, but in the end, I think uh, the probability, I agree with you. Okay, thank you. Um, I would again say possible but without any paper trail, any really convincing sightings. Remember, this guy was pretty famous, um, one of the most famous uh, Americans in Asia at the time. It seems like he would have had to go through an enormous amount of effort. And here's a guy who couldn't even fill out the paperwork right to get out of Bangkok, but he's doing all of these amazing things. I mean, he was, he, as 61 isn't old these days, I, I hope. Uh, but he was, he was getting along, and he was not in the greatest of shape. So uh, I think it's possible, but I would say unlikely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question at the mic, perhaps? Yes, great. Hello, I'm Kyle Carthy. Um, I'm not a member of the Foreign Correspondents Club. First question is, have you seen that uh, documentary where you've got all the Australian girls and the woman who was the host in the house? So th this is a documentary about the house itself? And well, when the woman traveled with him and she said, oh, oh, Jim and I went away for the weekend and we got down there and then the woman says, we all went for lunch, he seemed terribly tired and we got back and I heard him pull the chair across the gravel. Have you seen that documentary? No. With our interview? Really interesting. Okay. And I saw it at Jim Sounds Thompson good. house in the museum upstairs. Okay. So I think that would be a really interesting okay. thing for you to good. see. Thank you. Because it, it um, it put in perspective for me, and the woman that was with him that was a lover, well, number one, I would say, you go to Jim Thompson house and you go, gay, 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 gay. I mean, gay. 
<laughs> Come on, it's gay. So, number one, when you were talking, I was going, this is gay. Um, and they didn't sleep in the same room. It's good when they went for their nap. They didn't have an afternoon matinee. So, I'm going gay, 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 gay. So, I just, I'm on this theme at the moment. So, what's your gay theory? Because I think that's <laughs> broken at the moment. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I have no gay theory except uh, that all I say is that the FBI thinks that that might have been a possibility, uh, as shown in the memo. Um, <laughs> they seem to thi have uh, thought that there might have been a gay connection right there in the Cameron Highlands, perhaps uh, some sort of gay spat between uh, Thompson and someone at this hotel who was a liaison with him. Uh, but they never came up with any evidence other than that one sentence. Uh, so I don't have any more than that, that one sentence. And the other thing is, a very old friend of mine, Jill Drive, who's now in her late 80s, shared a key lodge with me at Mount Buller in Australia that is co-owned to a bunch of Aussie families. Mm -hmm. And he was the person from there. The, okay. The um, you did say that his uh, he was up at the Cameron Highlands with his lover, and there was this. Uh, he was traveling with a woman named Connie Monkskow, um, and she was a famous uh, uh, art collector and uh, had an antiques shop, and they did a lot of business together and were great friends. But I've never. Uh, I've actually interviewed her granddaughter, and I've talk to people, and everyone seems to agree that they were friends, Absolutely. period. Absolutely. Yeah, what okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know about everybody else, but I'd love to see that documentary as reenacted by the gentleman again. Um, <laughs> let's move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, we have somebody at the mic. Yes, this, um, I'm sorry, Joe Arden, I'm a club member, and this is not an important question vis-a-vis -vis Jim Thompson, but you referred on a couple of occasions, if I heard you correctly, to papers that were required when one left Bangkok. Uh, I was living in Bangkok in 1966, 67, 68, went X number of times to Malaysia, including two or three times to the Cameron Highlands, and I'll certainly bow to your memory or to your facts, but I recall no papers at all required to leave Bangkok. Yeah. One went to the airport, one showed one's passport, and one left. What, okay. what papers are you referring to? Right. So the source on that um, is at least two of those four books um, state that at the time uh, you had to have your passport but also proof that you had paid your taxes and it was some sort of revenue uh, department form that had to be filled out uh, and presented uh, and at the time. Now, I wasn't there but uh, I'm just the messenger, I, and that's yeah, what they say. I, I can assure you that I never filled out as a 22 or 3-year-old any, any report like that at all. Okay. With, uh -huh. certain, with okay. certainty, I can say that. Okay. There we go. And another question? Yeah. Great. Keep them coming. Hi. Oliver Holmes from The Guardian. I'd like to ask, um, at the very end, you discussed talking about cadaver dogs restarting the search. Is there any possibility that that could happen in the near future? Some possibility. Um, you know, I, I would not like to leave this case just the way I've done. Uh, I mean, the reason I created this massive uh, report and so on is that so somebody 100 years from now could still pick up and, and uh, try to solve it because cadaver dogs can find things way over 100 years uh, old, can find bones. But I would like to see this solved in my lifetime. And I think there's a slim possibility that it could be restarted. Um, that would require, in my opinion, some, a real expert in those different steps. And I am not that expert. I'm more of a generalist. But you need an expert in, first of all, carving up the, um, the terrain into uh, segments that would then be voted on in the Matson voting procedure. Mass and voting sounds silly, but it, it really works. I've seen it work. It's amazing. Um, so 
I've been in touch with a couple of people, including that Robert Kester, the one of the best people in the world on this. I don't know, maybe. And got another person who might be a possibility, uh, maybe. Metron would be fantastic to get them involved, and I think they are the best in the world. Um, they could uh, then do the heat probability mapping and, and that sort of thing. Um, they need, uh, money needs to be raised in order to get their attention. Uh, they're a business and, um, you know, I understand that. So you need to go through those steps and then you need to mobilize, you know, once you've got the segments voted on and you could target your, um, uh, your search, you need to find small enough segments that you wouldn't need hundreds and thousands of dogs. I mean, that's, that's not feasible. You know, and dogs, cadaver dogs are fantastic, but they can't work for more than a few hours because their brain just gets totally overloaded and they get exhausted. Uh, what they're doing is they're using that encyclopedia in their brain of all the scents in the world that they've ever smelled, and they're smelling every object as they go along and, uh, you know, matching it. Um, so you need to be able to get it down to a feasible area and you need to get some dogs up there and they need to be really good ones. There's only one dog team like that, I believe, in all of Malaysia, so they'd probably have to be brought in from overseas, so you're talking some money now. So you put all that together and me being a probability guy, the probability of all of that happening is fairly low, but it is possible. Uh, and I'm doing some things to try to make it happen, but I'd say the probability is low. So, so what's your estimation uh, for how much money you need to start a search again, just in case some of you have deep pockets out there? <laughs> um, I would say several hundred thousand dollars, U.S. dollars would do it. There you go. If you want the mystery solved. Right. There are billionaires in the world uh, to whom that is a parking ticket. <laughs> Another question. Hi there, Ruben Easy from uh, AFP. Uh, you've already said some people have talked about the possibility of the uh, North Vietnamese, I think, possibly murdering his sister and that this was uh, far-fetched in your view. But I was just wondering, given who he was, his life history, and the fact this was the height of the Cold War, has the possibility of assassination by a foreign power ever been raised of him, himself? The Everything that I've read has only mentioned uh, communist terrorists uh, sponsored largely by the Chinese who were on the border. Um, but he had made, you know, a number of enemies uh, over the years. He was very sympathetic, actually, to the Pathet Lao when he first arrived in this uh, country. He made enemies of the French, uh, and there's actually some documentation in the National Archives saying that um, uh, uh, there's an official protest from the French in about what, 1959 or so that says, you know, this guy, Colonel Jim Thompson, is shipping medical supplies to anti-French um, uh, forces in Cambodia. And what are you, the State Department, going to do about it? And their response is, uh, well, uh, you know, it's only medical supplies. And, and uh, you know, clearly they were siding with CIA, who at the time was uh, anti-colonial, as was um, Jim Thompson. So, yeah, he had enemies along the line, uh, you know, in various quarters. I think, again, all of those are possibilities. I would say that, you know, it's been 50 years since the disappearance, and no, nobody has really done that much investigation that I'm aware of, except for that one book by Joshua Kurlancic, uh, what was going on here and uh, along the lines of what you're talking about. And I think it would be great if the press corps today would do more uh, to look into those. And if they could solve the case through some kind of analysis uh, like that, a business associate or a foreign power or something, fantastic. Then I wouldn't have to go out into the jungle. No one's at the mic. All right. With that, I'll All right. wrap up. Thank you very much. Um, please give a hand to Lou for his <laughs> fascinating and very informative, factually based retirement project. <laughs>
Um, and if you have any questions, you uh, obviously feel free to come up and talk to him in person. As always, I'd like to encourage you to join us as a member. If you're not already a member, if you like programs like this one, we have them all the time, uh, at least once a week, in fact. So there are applications that are right at the door if you're interested in joining us as a member. Um, we have lots of fun events like this all the time. Thank you very much for coming and staying till the end, and uh, I hope to see more of you guys. Right. Sure. <laughs>